lesson is about working with radical equations and solving them by graphing or using algebraic approaches. A uh, definition of a radical equation is when you have an unknown in the radicand, inside the radical, and an equal sign. The goal of an equation is to solve to find the roots. A graphical approach is looking visually for values of f of x equals 0 once you've isolated the equation terms having 0 on the other side. So if we look at a graph image and see where the graph crosses the x-axis, where y is 0, that's corresponding to the x-intercept, zeros, or roots. So steps in a graphical approach would be first to ensure all terms are isolated to one side, determine the domain, try domain, try to determine the range if possible, sometimes it's difficult, find some points that satisfy these conditions ideally. A f of A, where f of A is more than 0, B f of B, where f of B is less than 0, and some value C, where the y value is 0. This would correspond to the actual solution that we seek. The positive and negative references before it suggest where you can find the solution somewhere in between it for a continuous function. Next, you'll sketch the graph using the points, the domain and range information, and the solutions are the zero on the graph. A couple of examples. First, this equation, uh, if I were to look at the domain, that would be where the radicand is greater than or equal to zero. So it corresponds to x less than or equal to positive 4. <clears throat> the range of this function can be found more easily if I write it this way, and I'm even going to factor the negative out inside the radicand. Now, if we think about transformation of functions, this represents a reflection with the negative sign over the y-axis, then a translation to the right of 4, then a translation of 2 units down. Radicals always produce positive results and are a minimum value of 0 when the index is 2. So the range of this function is greater than or equal to negative 2. Now, <clears throat> we're referencing the function y equals root x if we're going to visualize these graphically and if we're not using technology. So the reflection of this graph is over here in quadrant 2. So it's going to have values here, here, and here. Then the translation 4 right and 2 down is going to produce a value here, here, and here. And that graphically is what we're looking for. Now, this, since it crosses the axis here, this is my solution, x equals 0. So you'll notice, <clears throat> because of my understanding about radicals and transformations, I was able to find a value below 0 or negative, and a value above 0 or positive, and a value that was 0. So this one came together quite easily. The next one won't be quite so easy. I've already begun it. Um, in this case, we have x inside the radicand, but we also have x outside the radicand. There's no domain restriction on the term outside. But because of the radicand, I say that 4 minus 3x itself has to be greater than or equal 0, leading to a domain restriction of less than or equal 4 thirds. So there's no values over here to the far right of the graph. Then, the range is going to be difficult to uh, determine because I have x both inside and outside. So I'm going to work with this end point of 4 thirds and suspect that that's going to be one of the limits of my range. Since square root functions or radicals just normally begin at the origin, that usually determines where your domain and your range start and end. When x is 4 thirds, that's actually a typo there, the y value is 4 thirds of 3, so 4, subtracted from 4 is 0, root of 0 is 0. So I'm left with 4 thirds plus 8, which is actually 28 over 3. And so, 28 over 3 is about 9 and a third. <clears throat> so I can plot that at about here. When I substitute 1 into the function, 4 minus 3 is 1, root of 1 is 1, 
1 plus 8 minus 8 makes 8. 1 comma 8 is a solution. Also 0 comma 6 is a solution. And I can see that the graph is sort of trending like this, this sort of idea. And I'm trying to figure out where that is. So I'd like to figure out a couple more points. So what I can do is this. I, I know I want to choose some x values whose result in the radicand can be evaluated easily. So for example, how can I make 4 minus 3x equal to 16? Because the root of 16 can be determined. Well, that happens when x equals negative 4. So let's substitute negative 4 into the equation and see what happens. <clears throat> if I put negative 4 in here, I get 16 in the radicand. The root of 16 is 4. I'm also putting negative 4 here. So I have negative 4 plus 8 minus 4, which is going to be 0. So I actually was very close in my estimation. 1, 2, 3, 4 units back right here is where my 0 is. And there's some sort of trending downward. <clears throat> so this represents, excuse me, my solution, x equals 4, or negative 4, pardon me. All right. Now, the, the example we just did without technology is kind of awkward and bulky. It's difficult to find the range. It's difficult to know everything very clearly without doing much more work. So there's another approach that is recommended, for, especially for questions like these, the algebraic solution approach. The steps are a little different. In the algebraic approach, we do something different to start with. We isolate the radical. We don't isolate all terms. We isolate the radical to one side of the equation. Next, consider the domain, because we're going to compare that to the solution we come up with later, which is called an apparent solution. We're not certain that it actually works. I'll show you in a moment. We raise both sides of the equation to the power that equals the radical index. In the case above, they would be squaring, to remove square roots. We solve the equation. If there's still a radical, which sometimes happens, you're going to repeat step 1 to 3 again. Once you're done, the solution that you found is an apparent solution. It might work or it might not. If it doesn't work, it's called extraneous. So we check it by substituting back in, and we also consider the domain that we came up with to make sure that it's not disobeying the domain. Let's look at the exact same questions we did a moment ago. Step 1, isolate radical to each side. That's already done. Step 2, domain. Well, we already figured out the domain from above. We had that the domain was x values less than or equal to negative 4, I believe. Let me just go check that. Nope, less than or equal to positive 4. My bad. All right, we're going to keep that in, in mind. Now, next step, we're going to write each side squared. A square of a square root will result in just a radicand being left. And if I move the 4 to the other side, I get 0. So x equals 0 is my apparent solution. Is 0 less than or equal to 4 in the domain? It passes the domain restriction. Let's substitute it back in and check. So my check would be 4 minus 0 square root. Does it equal 2? Yes, it does. Let's look at that harder case. Okay, the harder case that we were looking at before, here it is. <clears throat> we are going to isolate the radical. In this case, move it to the right side to make it positive. On the left side, we're left with x plus 8. We are going to raise each side of the equation, not each term, but each side of the equation gets squared. This is a binomial square. There's a pattern for expanding that that you should know. There it is. And the square of the square root leave just the radicand behind. This is a quadratic equation now. We're going to gather all the terms to one side. 19x plus 60, nothing on the other side. We're looking to factor this if we can, and usually they will. They're being kind to us when they give us these questions. I want two numbers that add to 19, multiply to 60. Those numbers are 4 and 15, leading to the roots of negative 4 and negative 15. Now note, the graphical method that we did before 
missed a root. The graphical method missed the negative 15. We would have to experiment more with values in order to have found that. Let me go back. Look what we did. We found the domain restriction, which suggested where to start. We found a couple of other points that were convenient, the trend. And I worked until I got a solution. And then I kind of got lazy a bit, and I thought, okay, well, I'm all done. It turns out in this problem, there are actually two different values that you can substitute, which will satisfy the equation. Negative 4 is only one of them. Again, look back at the algebraic solution, and we see that there are two different results. Now, we should check the domain on this. The domain restriction, let's go back and check. The domain restriction was less than equal 4 thirds. Less than or equal to 4 thirds. Well, both of them passed the domain restriction. So the only thing left to do is a quick check. Let's substitute negative 4 into both locations and make sure that we actually get something that works. Negative 4 plus 8 is 4. This is 16, so 4 minus 4 equals 0. That works. Let's check the other one. Negative 15 plus 8 minus root of 4 minus 3 times negative 15. Well, that's 45, and 4 is 49. The root of that is 7. Negative 15, add 8, minus 7 is also 0. No, pardon me, it is not 0. <laughs> I jumped the gun. It is negative. So, x equals 15 is extraneous. It's not a permissible root. And that's why you need to check your work. So, actually, in the end, we ended up lucking out graphically. We never really thought about anything further. But we suspected there was nothing, and we lucked out, and we were actually right. The algebraic solution would show additional potential or apparent roots that we would then check. In this case, there's an extraneous root. So, only negative 4 is a root that's valid and works.